50 years ago on Yom Kippur morning. Rabbi Krolov stood on this bima and went off script, interspersed with words from our machzor. He updated the congregation. Egyptian artillery and air force bombard Israel's army bases in the Sinai. 70,000 Egyptian troops, 13 infantry divisions, and 1,000 tanks across the Suez Canal. Sirens blare across Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and throughout the country. In between the Torah service and the Vidui, another update. Two Syrian armored divisions attacked along the front line with air support at several points. 40,000 Syrian troops with tanks entered the Golan Heights. Shock permeated these pews. Karangans whispered throughout the service as news of continued attacks trickled in. It was hard to focus on the solemn Yom Kippur prayers in face of such grave concern about Israel's very survival. Rather than looking inward, those gathered in the sanctuary poured their hearts into prayers for the safety of their brothers and sisters in Israel. Following the surprise invasion, it took Israel three, full, three days to fully mobilize its army during which time the Egyptians and Syrians were able to consolidate their gains. Despite their initial losses, the Israeli Defense Force launched a massive counteroffensive, which brought them within the artillery range of Damascus and across the Suez. While the fighting ended three weeks later with impressive IDF battlefield victories, the war left Israel shocked and traumatized. The Yom Kippur War cost Israelis over 2,600 lives and over 7,000 injuries. For the first time in recent memory, Israel, Israelis felt vulnerable, and the war undercut many of their beliefs that their country was unbeatable. On this Day of Atonement, we reflect on the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. We remember those killed during the battles and those who have lasting injuries. During our afternoon service as part of the martyrology, we will hear a personal remembrance from our fellow congregants Razi Kami Cohen who had recently enlisted in the IDF at that time. <coughs> on this Day of Atonement, we also reflect on the response from American Jews 50 years ago. In that moment of existential threat to Israel, the American Jewish community sprang into action, raising funds, lobbying Congress and the White House, and working to build widespread support among the general public for the beleaguered Jewish state. The United Jewish Appeal raised nearly $668 million for its annual campaign, $290 million more than the year before, with 75% of all donations received during the war. Within days of the Yom Kippur, whole communities met in synagogue sanctuaries and Jewish community centers to organize letter-writing campaigns, phone-a-thons, and blood drives. On October 9th, as the Soviet Union began sending additional arms to Egypt and Syria, some 1,000 rabbis and Jewish communal leaders convened in Washington. They hand-delivered a letter urging President Nixon to send aid to Israel. And within hours, the Jewish leaders announced that the U.S. government 
would replenish losses in aircraft and give aid to Israel. 50 years ago, when Israel faced an existential crisis, our synagogue, our reform movements, and the American Jewish community came together to stand up, speak out, and support the young country. Today, Israel once again faces an existential crisis. In 75 years of Israel's statehood, there has not been a time when Israel's enemies have not tried to destroy it. Israel faces countries and terrorist organizations that aim to wipe Israel off the map. As North American Zionists, we are ready to protect Israel from exterior enemies. And we must always be ready to continue to defend Israel from these threats. But the existential crisis I refer to today instead originates from within. The assault on Israel's democracy. The question that we must ask is, are we ready to stand up, speak out, and make sure that the Israel we love will be a Jewish and democratic state for the next 75 years. The current Israeli government is the most right-wing and ultra-religious government that Israel has ever had. The government is comprised of ministers who have routinely engaged in long-standing attacks against the LGBTQ communities, freedoms for progressive Jews, and Israeli and Palestinian civil society. In the past year, ministers of the Knesset have called to revoke reform and conservative conversions, to require women to sit on the back of the bus, and to annex and build on Palestinian land. To implement their extreme policies, the coalition government has pushed forward a set of judicial reforms that will limit the role of Israel's judiciary, the only check on the current government. Most Israelis do believe that there should be some judicial reform, specifically diversifying the courts. Many Israelis do not see themselves, their parents, or their Israeli identity reflected in the current court makeup. There needs to be more Mizrahim and a wider range of viewpoints on the bench. Yet the extremists in this current government go further than diversifying the courts. Israelis from the left and right, secular and religious, Bedouin and Palestinians, are outraged by these anti-democratic plans and are seeking compromise to the reforms. For the past 38 weeks, millions of Israelis have taken to the streets to protest the government. It has been reported that a quarter of all Israelis have participated in a protest. This summer, at the end of Shabbat, I joined thousands of Israelis in front of the president's home in Jerusalem for an anti-judicial overhaul protest, which was truly a spiritual experience. The protest started with Havdalah, and then speakers from different walks of life shared their stories, their hopes, and their dreams for Israel. Protesters beat drums, shouted democracy, waved their Israeli flags proudly, and saying, Ainli Eretz Acheret, I have no other country. Reporter Susie Linfield writes, these protesters have unashamedly put themselves forth as patriots. They have seized the flag back from racist hooligans who terrorized local Palestinians in Jerusalem in the annual flag parade. They have refused to be intimidated by the right's traditional accusation of treason. They have proudly declared that democracy is patriotism and vice versa. 
the protest movement wants to preserve the Israel presented in the Declaration of Independence, a Jewish state rooted in Jewish history, in a country that provides equal rights to minorities, genders, and different religions. Some may say that we, as American Jews, do not have a right to speak out about what is happening in Israel. We have long heard the argument that when your lives are not directly on the firing lines, or your livelihoods are not impacted by a court's decision, you can't fully understand, and therefore have no right to raise questions especially questions that might be contrary to a democratically elected government. This has been a persuasive point in the past. But this year, when Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East, is at risk, this line of thinking may no longer be appropriate. I have grave concerns regarding where uncritical support of Israel has led, but more importantly, to where it may lead. I'm concerned that if certain policies are implemented by this government, the type of support our community will be able to rally not this year or next year, but a generation down the line will be less impassioned and less committed. How strong will our children's or grandchildren's support be for an Israel whose values no longer align with ours? I believe strongly that our children will care more if we discuss Israel warts and all than if we try to pass off an idealist picture. Daniel Gordes, an author and fellow at Shalom, College in Jerusalem in an interview with the Times of Israel last week said, it's important for the diaspora community to get involved. Because if you know that it's, this is happening and you, and you stay silent, you are putting yourselves firmly on the wrong side of history. Many Jewish American organizations, congregations, and the JCCs have remained quiet because they don't want to rock the boat. Gordas goes on by saying, there's been a lot of other times in human history when people felt it would be rocking the boat to come out on a very clear moral issue. And they're not looked on kindly in history. This is an opportunity not to place ourselves on what is the wrong side of history. I must speak out because I love Israel. I hope you have felt my love for Israel during my 10 years as a rabbi here. Together, we have brought in some of the top thinkers, artists, and musicians of Israel. We have partnered with Federation to have shlichim, emissaries, teaching our adults and teens. We've created an Israel engagement committee, and now we have yearly trips to Israel. A love of Israel is at the center of this congregation. And because I love Israel, I'm deeply concerned that the zealotry and corruption of this government is not only threatening the rights of reformed Jews, but threatening Israel's democracy roots and Israel's success story. So what can we do? First, despite our concern, we can't walk away. We must remain connected. We must continue to educate ourselves on what is happening in Israel. We are incredibly lucky to have Rabbi Eric Yaffe as a member of this congregation. For the past 40 years, Rabbi Yaffe has helped us navigate the news of Israel, from elections to intifadas to peace agreements. And I hope that you will join him today at 
in the chapel for his candor and his insights into this moment in Israeli history. Our synagogue is committed to bringing speakers throughout the year as the situation in Israel constantly changes. On October 12th, we will be joined by Orly Erez Lachowski, CEO of the Israeli Religious Action Center, who fights to secure civil rights for a just and egalitarian Israel. She's a passionate speaker and a strong leader of the Israeli reform movement. Our Israeli engagement committee also has plans to organize small groups of learning to dig deep into the proposed judicial reform bills. We want to go beyond the sound bites, and we want to do that together. We also must financially support organizations and institutions that are fighting for democracy, transparency, and civic engagement. Supporting the Israeli Religious Action Center and the Israeli Movement for Progressive Judaism and other organizations fighting to safeguard Israel democratic principles is a way that we can say to Israelis on the streets that we stand with them. And finally, as I spoke last year, we need to show up and travel to Israel. Over 60 congregants answered that call last Yom Kippur and joined our Federation's mission this past summer. Because of our travels, we have a better understanding of the complexities of Israel and a deeper connection to the land and the people. We can also show up at protests here in the United States. This past week, during Minister, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's visit, visit, protests both Israelis and um, uh, American Jews made it clear that we are deeply concerned about the situation. By being involved, we are showing our solidarity with those Israelis who are fighting for democracy. Yossi Klein Halevi, an Israeli author and journalist that spoke to us this past spring, writes, what is at stake is the moral caliber of diaspora Judaism. If we Israelis are in this by ourselves, let's not pretend that we are one people anymore. If people don't want to respond to a Jewish state that is flirting with becoming a fundamentally racist, bigoted, and hatred of the LGBT community, then the notion of the shared Jewish peoplehood is a thing of the past. At many of the protests this past year, including the one I intended, protesters yelled out, Busha! Shame in Hebrew. The Hebrew word busha shares the same Hebrew letters, bet, vav, shin, as the word shuva, meaning return, but in reverse. Shuva is a familiar word to many during these days of awe. Rabbi Sharon Cohen Anisfeld, the dean of Hebrew College at Boston, writes, these words beckon us now during this High Holy Days, from bush to shuv, from shame to return, a return to ourselves, to each other, to the values that we hold dear, to the vision of Israel we aspire to, to the love and hope that gives us strength to carry on. On this, 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. We remember the solidarity and support that this community provided with Israel when Israel was on the brink of destruction. 